Our text this morning is John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood outside the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? But she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, where have you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said, Rabbi, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go and to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Let us pray. Father, your word is sweet as honey to us, especially the message of our Lord's resurrection is a delight to our ears and to our hearts. May we receive this and be strengthened and grow. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. There are many stories presented in the Gospels. Some of these stories differ in perspective Some tell the story a little bit differently than others. But there is one story that is the same, that is verified in each telling. That is the bodily resurrection of Jesus. When I say the word resurrection, it's necessary to explain what is meant. Jesus did not merely revive after a near-death experience, as if one could revive after being crucified. If you are feeling the strength to do so, go ahead and research what all is involved in an authentic Roman crucifixion. I would say probably don't do that this afternoon, though, unless you want to be discouraged. Jesus died, though, and returned with a new and perfect body, the likes of which none of us has ever seen before. The resurrection was the culmination of the work of Christ on earth, vindicating all he and the prophets ever said. Our faith stands and falls on the truth of the resurrection. For it testifies to the true word, it testifies to the true God and the faithfulness of his word. What's more, the resurrection is the beginning of the restoration of God's people and the restoration of his world. But before we get to that good news, it's good to emphasize just how fantastic, how outlandish this story is. Now, as Christians, we've heard this. We've heard it year after year after year. And the danger here is we are inoculated, likely, to its strangeness. The fact that Jesus died was not supernatural. We all will die. To die in accordance to so many prophecies as he did, is amazing. But a premeditated murder of a man to preserve 
The political power of one group is as normal to history as fireworks on the 4th of July. The bizarre part begins the first day of the week. Up to that point, the miracles of Jesus only restored what would still eventually decay. That is, things like healing someone. All the people that Jesus healed eventually died, and their flesh went back to dust. Though they were healed, death would still come. The food that he multiplied, as we've heard proclaimed in recent weeks, that food was still used, it was eaten, and that food would still, had it not been eaten, it would have disintegrated. Skeptics attempt to explain the miracles of Jesus through natural means. They say things like, maybe the multitudes already had some bread that the gospel writers just failed to mention. Maybe the, the lame and the blind and the lepers, maybe they were already just about to be healed. Maybe they had a natural condition that was going to get well anyway, and Jesus just happened to be there at the right time, and it was a trick of the eye. They, they, they give all kinds of, of ex explanations like this. But the bodily resurrection of Jesus is no temporary remission of a physical problem. The resurrection is the very reversal of death itself. In the resurrection, death died. It's easier to believe in the previous existence of dragons, giants, fairies, and satyrs than to believe that almost 2,000 years ago, the incarnate God-man who had died came out of the tomb with a new body that couldn't be stopped by doors, locks, or time itself. If this is true, and it is, no power can overcome what God has planned for his world. Los Angeles homicide detective J. Warner Wallace was an atheist who decided to investigate the claims of Jesus' resurrection. He began with the belief that a story like this could not stand the light of modern investigation, modern investigation techniques. He discovered in his research four facts that were accepted by both skeptics and Christians alike. Here are these four facts. Number one, Jesus died on a cross and was buried. Everyone agrees on that. And the following. Number two, Jesus' tomb was empty and no one ever produced his body. Number three, Jesus' disciples believed they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. And number four, Jesus' disciples were transformed following their alleged resurrection observations. So he said, from these facts, a proper investigation, just like if, you're, if you come upon uh, uh, the scene of a crime, you look at all the evidence that is presented there. You, you take the evidence that everyone observes, and then from that evidence, you make possible guesses. You develop a hypothesis. What are the different things that could have happened here? And from the evidence that I just gave you, there are four possibilities. They are number one, the disciples were delusional. Number two, they were deceived. Number three, they could have purposefully lied. Number four, the resurrection is true. Now each of these positions, each of these possibilities has several liabilities or several deficiencies associated with it, except one. And that one is the bodily 
resurrection of Jesus. The bodily resurrection has one liability, but it's significant. And that is, you must believe in the supernatural for that to be true. Yet for many people, they will believe anything, even less plausible perspectives, as long as it allows them to deny the resurrection of Jesus. As a result of his work, of his investigation, Wallace became convinced of the truth of Jesus' resurrection. As one who is an atheist, who, after his investigation, he became convinced, but there's another side to it. Merely presenting facts is not enough. Yes, ours is a reasonable faith. It's not based on blind leaps. There are definitely facts and a significant number of facts one could marshal in favor of every claim that is given in Scripture. But becoming a disciple of Jesus is not just about acquiring more facts. It is a battle of the heart and a battle in the heart. That's where the resurrection becomes personal. The truth came to Mary and comes to us not just as facts, but in the flesh. The truth comes in flesh and restores hope. Wherever Jesus went after his resurrection, one common trait you see is those who observe him, their hope is restored, their hearts are renewed. He still does that today. The good news of the resurrection is not just that the facts are on our side. It is that hope is restored eternally. This begs a question, a question that every Christian must answer. How do you deal with unbelief? When you've suffered, when your hope is lost, when you feel the ground under you is shifting, it is a battle. Think about what the disciples had seen. Not just those who were the 11 disciples who were alive at this point and all the others who were loyal to Jesus. Think of what they'd seen. They had seen their Savior, the one whom they had given themselves for all that time, die brutally. They saw the religious leaders, those who they had given themselves to in the past, turn against Jesus, they saw the Romans crucify him. And if everything you've given your life to goes away, don't say they didn't battle unbelief. It's a battle for them, and it's a battle for us. So we can't pretend like the Christian life is something where we're just going from glory to glory and it gets better and better and then everyone who's having a bad time better just keep your mouth shut because you don't want to make the Christian life look bad. It doesn't work like that. If you live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. It's through tribulation that you must enter the kingdom of God and it's through tribulation that Jesus Christ brought the kingdom of God. It continues. Some think that because they are tempted to unbelief that they must not belong to God. But I've got good news for you. The very temptation to doubt means the enemy wants you, not that he has you. If you're tempted to doubt, it's because the enemy is fighting for you. If you didn't if it's not even a battle, that's a problem. 
But when you feel the wrestling going on, that means that Satan wants you and that God is with you still. The question is then, what do you do with your unbelief? So we can look at Jesus' followers here. We can see how they responded to this. And we can take hope. Because Jesus not only came to them, the same one who appeared to his disciples gave them a message. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Have you ever thought or have you ever considered how odd it is that Jesus' first appearance, his first resurrection appearance was not in a glorified manner, but it was in normal attire. Mary thought he was a gardener. Not a very kingly, well, you, you can make an argument that kings are gardeners in ancient times, yes. But, you know, to think this is the gardener is not a, an, an overly impressive idea. But that's how Jesus comes. Like the, the hymn, Abide With Me, written by Henry Light, one of the verses says, Come not in terror as the king of kings, but kind and good with healing in thy wings. That's how Jesus comes. He came to Mary like this. And like Mary, we all face times when our vision is blurred. Our spiritual sight is dim. And it feels like the world is foggy. And we look around and we say, I can't even see my hand in front of my face. I don't feel like my faith has any weight to it. Mary was weeping. And she is asked twice here. We see in the passage, first the angels appear. And she's weeping. And even when the angels appear, does she say, oh, well, of course. This is an angel. Why am I crying? No. Even after she beheld the angel, they said, why are you weeping? She says, they've taken the Lord. And I don't know where he is. And then she turns around and Jesus asks her the same question. As the gardener. And I want to tell you something. For every person like Mary, whose vision is blurred, whose heart is burdened, for every person who's seeking the truth, Jesus stands before you. No, he does not come in glory right now. But he comes to you in normal means. Just as he came to Mary in the normal attire of a gardener, he comes to us in the normal means of his word, his sacraments, and his saints. As he did with Mary, he makes us wait. Even when he came to Mary, when he spoke to her, he called her name. She recognized him. Can you imagine the feeling of fullness that she has? All the emotions that, that had been going on in her, all the tears that, had, that she had shed, not just this day, but the previous days, and now she sees him, and of course re her reason is totally turned upside down. What would you want to do? You would want to come and clean. You want to grab hold. You're excited because your total life is overturned at this point, and Jesus says, not yet. Not yet. Why not? Come on. This, this, you're the risen Savior. I can't come yet. What is wrong? Why? He says, don't cling to me yet. I've not ascended. We're impatient. And we want our answers immediately. We want our hopes and dreams fulfilled right now. But belief, saints of Christ, the belief does not mean having all our questions answered. 
It means believing what He has revealed and trusting that He will reveal the rest in His time. And the rest is usually the stuff we really want. We have all that He's given us, but we always want more. And that's fine. It's great. Question, want more. Fantastic. But also be content when He doesn't give it. He has His reasons. But guess what? You as a finite being will always be a finite being. And when you are with the Lord eternally, you'll still be finite. And there will be things for you to learn throughout all of eternity. It's never going to stop. Then it will go from glory to glory and greater glory. Waiting, though, means more than sitting idly by. Jesus had a job for Mary. He said, go and tell them. Go to my brothers. Those all of whom, except for John, who was there with Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the cross, all the others, had they weren't there. And Jesus still calls them my brothers. Go to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending. Don't just say I'm, I, I'm risen. Tell them I am ascending. Why did he do that? Jesus is, is giving a message. He's hearkening back to the prophecy of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 when it says that the Son of Man come in this prophecy, the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days and receives glory and dominion and power. This is the message Mary delivers. When she says, tell them that I'm ascending, where else in Scripture did Jesus talk about His ascension? It's the prophet Daniel. So it's not just tell them I'm going up. No. It's tell them I'm going to take the throne. That's the message. Mary was given the first great commission. We, we, we hear about the great commission, right? Matthew chapter 28, Mark 16. The first great commission given is John chapter 20, verses, start with verse 17. But even in this, he's telling her to deliver a message where there's no demonstration of glory. It's just the Word of God spoken to her. We want the glory of Christ. We want to be with Him. I hope that you want more of Christ now than you have in the past. And if you say, Pastor, I can't even see I want to want him, but I don't feel it. That's okay too. Because he's here. And he says, as we've already said a little bit ago, just wait. We want to be with Him. We want to be joined with Him forever, like Paul said when he said, I have such a desire to depart and be with the Lord in Philippians chapter 1. That's my desire. I want to leave here, but for you, I'm going to stay because it's better this way. We want to be with Him, but just like to Mary, He says, no, not yet. First, fulfill my commission. First, go and make this announcement that I am ascending to the glory and dominion promised to me from the beginning. The first person called by Christ to proclaim the good news of his resurrection and ascension to the throne was one whose former life was wrecked by sin, but who had been changed by Jesus. Whoever you are in this room, don't say, God can't use me. You have no idea what I've done. You have no idea what I'm like or what I used to be like, and you have no idea. Well, I don't. Jesus does. 
And if he can use Mary Magdalene to deliver the message, the first person he would choose to use. Of all the people he could have appeared to, he's choosing to go to her. If God can use her, he can use you. Because the power is not in the person. It's in the power of God. It's in the God who dwells in the person. The story of a dying and rising God was what the world had been waiting for. In all of her stories, her mythologies, and her expectations, everything that had been written in the past, no matter what culture you're talking about, there are stories of those who would die and rise, but they don't rise to this. They don't come to the level of what we read in Scripture. This is not just a tall tale. It's what Tolkien calls the only true myth. A story that gives us origins, but it's not one that's made up. All those other made up stories are vague mirrors and pictures of this true story. This story both defies and fulfills the imagination bringing together everything you've hoped for but could never fully express. If you believe what the, in the story of the resurrection, if you believe this, nothing that God has revealed in His Word is too hard to believe. No promise is too far-fetched. And if you think that what He's done in the last 2,000 years is impressive. Just wait. This is only a foretaste of the good things He has prepared for those who love Him. This is the good news of the resurrection.